are you going to edit things or is it all one take and you're throwing everything? I in? would really like to do one take. So um, I'm kind of an 80% person. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so, um, and I also like to um, have the flaws in. So I do this in my videos. You do it also. Mm -hmm. um, so I guess we will just do one shot and see where it goes. And if Sounds there's good. something we are not too proud of, then we can. <laughs> can <laughs> okay. Sure. Good. So uh, today I'm with uh, Noel from Noel's Retro Lab, um, one of my absolutely favorite uh, YouTube retro channels. And um, this is a new series called Background Check, where I do interviews with um, retro tubers and makers. And the idea is to get some insights into the lives and the motivation of uh, people who do retro stuff. So there's this YouTube rule which says you have 90% people watching. You have 9% people participating and interacting and 1% of the people who are on YouTube actually create content. And uh, I want to know what motivates these 1% and uh, what's their background. So this is background check and here's Noel. Hi, Noel. Hey, hang on a second. How do I turn on the video? There you go. Great uh, that you made the time for this. Um, really, really enjoy your channel and the stuff you put out. Thank you. Very nice, very in depth and uh, I guess that is what hooked me to your channel in the first place. Um, uh, you did a video, video I guess on the C64, uh, C64 repair and um, one thing you did which nobody else did was put a diagram of the IC I guess on the screen and uh, the probes. Right, right. A lot of people say that and it's interesting because that's something that I've done from the very first video. It's something yeah. that I said you know I want to do this but I definitely want to be showing this. I guess I'm just a very visual person and I'm always working with diagrams and schematics. And if I'm doing that, I want people to follow along that way. Right. So <laughs> it just makes sense. <laughs> yeah. And I hate if I see some videos of people doing stuff and you can't follow along. I think, hey, what's the point of this video? It's nice to right. see how someone is soldering or stuff like that, but I want to follow along. Right. It drives right. me crazy. <laughs> yeah. Okay. So that might be <laughs> some part of this interview actually <laughs> already. Um, um, yeah. yeah, let's get right into it. Um, so to, to, to make a good intro, um, what's, what's your background? How did you get to make retro videos? Well, my, I guess things start all the way in the eighties, like most of us probably for retro video makers or whatever you want to call us. For me it was that, you know, being involved with eight bit computers back in the eighties and specifically as people who follow my channel, they know that I have a a soft spot for Amstrad CPCs, but I really, I love them. I love all of them, including computers that I never actually met back in the day at all. But computers back then had a big impact on me. It was, I, I, I often tell the story that I didn't own a computer. Well, actually my, my dad one day brought this like Casio PB100 calculator slash computer. That's, that's actually how I, my, my first introduction ever. Okay. But but then it was going to a friend's house and seeing his Amstrad CPC and being just blown away, completely blown away. And one interesting bit was that you know he showed you know put out some games and we played a couple of games and for five minutes I was just completely enthralled by it and, and blown away. And then five minutes after that I said I want to make games like those. I don't know why it was just like the instinct that just the reaction was like I just have to make games and there was something about those games that you can see those and even without knowing any programming you can see like I'm able to make that I, I think it, like somebody sees a PlayStation 5 game today and they're they they're not gonna say I want to make a game like that or at least they're not gonna see the path to make a game yeah. like that but there I saw it and and that's how it started and so actually you know, it became very involved with making games and um, actually became a professional game developer. But it all comes back to retro videos when a few years ago, so I, I moved to the US for many, many years. And then even though we'd come back here in the summers and then, but a few years ago, we moved back to Spain. And one of the first things I had to do is like, okay, I want to get an Amstrad again. And so I got it, I shared it with my daughter. It was a, a, a lot of fun. And one day, 
in the middle of playing a game, the screen froze and something got garbled or something. And it was like, oh no, you know, it stopped working. And I decided to like, let me see if this is possible to fix it. I was never really into fixing computers or even like one of my secrets is like back in the 80s, I had this Amstrad. I never once opened it up. It even had signs in the back. Do not open this computer, it's dangerous. Like I never touched it. Mm -hmm. And with this one, I'm like, okay, well, let's see. You know, you know it's a bummer that it, it, something happened. Let me do some search on the internet, which of course we didn't have internet back then. And it's like, oh, maybe I can look into it. And I spent a while and I fixed it. And then that was very rewarding and, and very fun. And it made me realize how much I enjoyed that, which is even part of what I studied. I studied, my background is, the actual degree is computer systems engineering, which is kind of like the digital end of hardware design rather than analog kind of thing. And, and you know, I guess firmware and things like that with a master in computer science and so more in the software side. So that's kind of exactly what I studied, but I never really studied it applied like that. And I really enjoyed it. And then it just went like, oh, well, maybe I should explore other computers. And I started getting other computers and repairing them and learning about them. And so I did that for quite a while. And then I started putting pictures on Instagram of all places mm -hmm. of some of the cool you know, boards and repairs. And then some people are like, why don't you make videos? Why don't you make videos? I'm like, no, nah, that takes too long. No, I don't want to get involved with that. <laughs> <laughs> and I guess they said it enough times that I'm like, fine, I'll, I'll give it a try. And it just, that's, that's how it got started. Okay. Yeah, I see that our, let's call it origin story is pretty similar. Uh -huh. um, when I was a kid, I didn't have a computer at first, um, and my best friend's father had a um, was a teacher, and he did um, computer science in schools in the late seventies, early eighties. And I visited um, them, and there was this pet. Um, actually, it was one of these. Uh -huh. <laughs> and um, my friend just loaded Scramble, which was a, a basic game. And mm -hmm. um, at some point, he pressed, I guess, run stop. <laughs> and type list and you could see the, uh, the listing. And, and, and then he started um, changing the number of likes and stuff. And I thought, hey, wow, okay. And um, I actually do um, or, or did uh, courses for kids here in Germany. And the first question I always asked them was, where do video games come from? And we have uh, Media Markt and Saturn here in Germany. Mm -hmm. And when I did this 10 years ago, the answer was almost always, Media Markt or Saturn, which are just some retailers for video games. And um, to tell them that they actually could make games just like you just uh, thought as a kid is just amazing. And that blew me away and I, ha I had to get into this. And then the C64 came out and I had the raw C64 with nothing else, no drives, no anything, just the C64 naked. And I was forced to program this thing. Right, right. And I was always a software guy. Uh, this repair stuff just happened uh, you could say as a childhood trauma. Um, <laughs> I had a friend uh, or two friends over and we wanted to play the Rocky Horror Picture Show, the game on the C64. Mm -hmm. and it was a cracked version. Um, I hope this is uh, okay to tell. <laughs> no, <laughs> it's, <laughs> I guess it's uh, past the uh, three years you could be prosecuted for that. And to start the game, you had to reset the machine. And I didn't have a reset uh, switch. And I, I never opened the C64. There was this label, just like you said, there was this label, do not open, uh, guarantee, uh, void, whatever. Um, and he took a paper clip and tried to reset the machine on the user port. And he mm. did reset, uh, did not a reset, but it made zzzz, and the machine died. Oh, wow. And I didn't have my C64, the only thing in my life back then for six weeks because it had to be repaired and sent into wherever. And that is my childhood trauma. And um, a few years ago, I decided, hey, I, I want to tackle this trauma. I want to be able to fix stuff like that. And that was my start into this whole thing. So I guess our um, yeah, origin story is <laughs> pretty similar. So yeah. you said you uh, went to the US. What did you do there? It was the last year in high school, so the year before going to, to the university, and it was just supposed to be the one year. It was an exchange program, you know, okay. like a typical thing, like a family hosts you and you do the year there and then you come back. But since it was the year before going to university, my friends there, in, in the US, you actually apply to go to college much earlier than you do in Spain. I don't know how it is in Germany, but you, you actually apply 
to go to college in the fall of the previous year. Yeah. So while I was there, they were applying to college and there was no internet back then or not usable one anyway. Mm -hmm. So they were getting brochures from different universities. And so I was seeing the brochures. I'm like, this looks great. <laughs> like, I, I want that. <laughs> and I applied to some of those um, universities as well and ended up getting a few of them and they have scholarships and all that. So I had to make the call to my parents like, so what do you think if I stay a little longer? <laughs> so then I stayed on for the, the four years of bachelor's and my master's. And by that point, actually, I even started with my doctorate because I thought I wanted to be a professor. Mm -hmm. And then I realized like, no, I don't really want to be a professor. Um, and that's when I thought, well, you know, the thing that I've always done as a hobby on the side is game development. Wouldn't it be hilarious if somebody actually paid me to do game development? You know, I was, so I was like, I'm just going to interview with some companies. And then if not, of course, I'll just get a boring job at Microsoft or, you know, IBM or whatever. And yeah, so I did that initial search and ended up starting to work for a professional game company and then did that for a bunch of years and then went, I decided that that was enough that I didn't like working in teams that big because when I started the whole team, the whole team, like programmers, designers, one producer, whatever artists, maybe we were like 10 people total. And that was like 1998. And when I was done with professional game companies, we were making a game, the team was about 300 people. So it's just no comparison. I mean, even if you know, I was a lead and it doesn't matter, it's just, it's not the same feel at all. So I just quit that and I went and made games independently. And so uh, I've had ups and downs with that. The, the, the very first attempt was a PlayStation 3 downloadable game. That's just when it was starting. Okay. I think that was like 2006 or 2007. And um, that didn't go anywhere after a year, but then the iPhone came out. And so I rode that wave for quite a while with the iPhone. It was actually paying for things and went really well. And so that's, that's, how, that's how things got going. And okay. yeah, I mean, all that time I was in the US. I see. And uh, you're still a game developer, right? So the, the retro YouTube channel is not your main income stream. That's right. Yeah. Um, I don't release many games. I'm a slow game developer. <laughs> <laughs> and even some of the ones that I've done along the way, I've actually canned them myself. I've decided, no, I'm not going to release this even after working in it for over a year. Just because I, the last part of game development is actually the, the, the polishing, the porting, mm -hmm. the marketing, and it's the phase that I enjoy the least. And so if I'm not convinced that the game can do reasonably well, it's just not worth it. Like the last thing I want to do is put myself through a year of that and then you know, not do anything. And it's really difficult with, with games right now to, to be noticed and, and, mm. and be financially successful. But yeah, I'm, right now I am working on a game. We still haven't announced it. It's with a very small team, but I have high hopes that this one will do well. It's actually the second is the sequel to a very famous indie game from 2006, 2007 or so. so right. um, if nothing else, it will have somewhat of the name from, from that. Um, so we're, we're hopeful that, that will do well. And yeah, we still have probably at least another year of that. So. Okay. So uh, your game developer, do you play any games? I almost don't play any video games these days, especially not in modern computers. I will play the occasional retro game. I barely don't have any time now with video, with making videos. I play, I used to play especially, but I play, the thing that still plays board games. I, that I really enjoy. And actually board games have really influenced how I design video games. There's, there's a lot of things from that space that I like. Mm -hmm. um, more than in the video game space. But I think the mix of the two things is actually really interesting. Okay. Yeah, I have um, one of the more recent games right here. Oh, right. As you can see, it's framed. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I like the idea of Cyberpunk 2077, but I'm not a particular gamer. So, yeah, I like to make games, the creative part of it, but uh, I had to frame this. Looks cool. Mm -hmm. um, feels nice, but... <laughs> I, I could rant on for hours about video games and modern video games and things that I 
thing that are obvious that should change about modern video games, but probably shouldn't get into that right now. <laughs> yeah, that's true. <laughs> I guess that would, <laughs> would go way ab uh, above the hour we, we have. Um, okay, um, who do you think is your audience for the retro channel? Um, <clears throat> well, clearly people interested in retro computers and well, so there, 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 there are multiple answers to that. Looking at the YouTube analytics, it shows that unfortunately is something like 99% male, which, you know, I, unfortunately I expect it because it's the stereotype, but I was hoping there would be more uh, than that. <clears throat> and about our age group. So that is not surprising there. The thing that surprises me is that I will often get in conversations with people who are not our age group. They're actually younger people that are interested in these machines, even though they did, they were not part of their childhood. I think that's yeah. very interesting. So there's, it, it gives me some hope that there's an appeal beyond just nostalgia to this. And then I think the, the other thing that you cannot see in the YouTube analytics that I, I think is my audience is people who enjoy that, but who are really curious about why things work the way they work. It's not about necessarily showing a game and remembering a game, but it's understanding why does this computer work this way? Or why does this computer have this palette? Or why does this computer, the games looked this way and not this way? Or why is the music different? I think people are curious about you know, understanding things at a deep level, mm -hmm. which is also to me, one of the things that makes 8-bit computers an amazing subject is that I think of them as the most complex system that a single person can hold completely on yeah. their head. And by completely, I mean completely, right? Like understanding like, oh, when this signal goes up, then this happens over here. I feel that when you cross this eight to 16-bit boundary, you either, I mean, I'm sure there's a few people in the world who can do it, but most people don't think they can completely hold a, an Amiga system in their head, yeah. right? They can, they can have a, a very approximate idea and even details and all that, but 8-bit computers are magical that way with the, just enough complexity that makes them very interesting. Yeah, that's true. Uh, do you know this uh, NAND to Tetris course? Yeah. Mm -mm. There's a, actually a book. It's called The Elements of Computing Systems. Uh -huh. And um, it shows you how to create your own machine, uh, your hardware machine, and then build an assembler and then do Tetris. So you start with a, a, a NAND gate mm -hmm. and you do everything up to Tetris. Mm -hmm. It's a complete course and it's pretty much what you just said. You have the, it's the ability to, to, um, to grasp the concept on all levels. And I right. think... You're absolutely right. That is um, totally true for 8-bit machines. There, there may be people who can do it with 16 and beyond, but <laughs> right. I think 8-bit is for people of our age to the <laughs> limit <laughs> yeah, um, yeah. To, to grasp. So um, do you have a message for your videos or why are you doing these videos? Just for self-enjoyment or is, is there, you said you want, wanted to be a professor um, and I have that in me to, to show people and tell, teach people and tell people. Um, I never thought about the professor connection. I, I don't think so. I think it was just mostly I wanted, I guess I wanted to share the things that I was going through. I mean, a lot of, so some of the, some of the videos are, are are different. There's different tones to them. There are some videos in which I'm tackling something that I know very well, and I'm just explaining that and, and, and sort of sharing. Actually, that's not true. Even the ones that I know well, I've actually usually learned things for that video. So really what I'm doing a lot of times I'm, is I'm really showing what I'm learning for, mm. for those videos. Yeah. Sometimes it's very in-depth, and sometimes it's like a completely new computer to me, like when I first got like the Sinclair QL. I had never used a Sinclair QL in my life. And Part of it was learning about it, learning the hardware, learning how to fix a simple repair, and it was just sharing that. So most of the time, I'm actually just showing the things that I'm learning by making the video. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, is there a reward in you, in for you? So do you have any kind of emotion if you post a video and people like it, stuff like that, to enjoy it? Um, <clears throat> it's definitely not the main motivation, and it, I even... If anything, the 
that might be a negative motivation to me is, 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 is not something I get overwhelmed eventually with like the amount of comments and I get frustrated because I cannot answer all the comments and it just makes it very difficult. And, um, I mean, it's really nice that it's reaching a lot of people, but it's definitely not the, oh, great. This video had this many views. And so I'm really happy. And this one did it. it it's definitely not that to me, the reward comes in making the video because like I said, like, because I'm learning new things and I'm hoping that I'm, I'm presenting new things. And I'm hoping that it has an effect on people that I, I've actually gotten a lot of feedback of like, oh, I had this computer forever. Your videos gave me the knowledge and the courage to actually open it up and try to get it working again. Mm -hmm. Or I went and tried to buy the, I bought the computer of my childhood and I tried to, so that kind of thing is really cool. It's like, okay, yeah. mission accomplished. That's exactly what I wanted. So it, <clears throat> that is really nice, but really the main motivation is I just, I'm really enjoying learning things and going deep into some, into some things and just sharing that with, with people. Okay. Yeah, I guess the world is um, at least for 20 years divided into people who, who are users mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. or those who make um, or creators and consumers. And um, one of the main reasons why I do videos is I have a son, you have a daughter. They are about the same age, I guess. Yep. And I want my son to, to, to know how stuff works. I don't want him to be a user. Right. <laughs> Might be a bit rude, but, uh, but that's the way it is. I, I, as a child, I was very curious and I um, do remember I had uh, the Star Wars Ewok village. Do you remember that from mm -hmm. Jedi? Of course. And um, I was always frustrated. It's, it's a um, forest setting, but there's no wind. So the leaves don't blow and stuff like that. And so I took um, a projector, not a video projector, but for these uh, little um, photos. Um, um, and I took it apart and there was a fan inside and I put this fan on mm -hmm. my Evoc village to have some wind. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And it was nine, um, I guess, or 10. No, it must have been 10, 1983 uh, was Jedi. And um, my parents got very upset with me. But if my son would do that, I would be proud. So <laughs> he's taking apart hard drives and stuff like that, not, not to, to gain real knowledge, but at least to open stuff and not be afraid to take a screwdriver and that. Right. Now you're, you're right. In the modern world, it's very easy to just be a consumer of, or a user of, of technology. Um, whereas in the 80s, you would turn on one of these computers and what do you get? You get the basic <laughs> prompt, right? Yeah. Immediate, like, so it's, it's, it's immediate. You don't have to wait 30 seconds, one minute, two minutes, yeah. and you can start typing things. You cannot break anything through the basic prompt, which is also liberating. Um, uh, you can't say the same thing about modern computers or, or cell phones or anything like that. So yeah, for sure. Encur I, I love encouraging that thing also on kids. It's actually even a, a project that I worked on I did some contracting a few years ago. It was called Project Hack, that it was supposed to be a laptop and a Linux distribution aimed at kids mm -hmm. specifically so they would be creators or they would, they would learn that they could hack or modify the technology, not mm -hmm. just use it. So it was exactly the principle you were talking about. Do you know Pico 8? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. It's one of those things. Pico 8 is one of those things like I wish I had thought about personally, I had made it myself. Uh, uh, <laughs> it's uh, for, for everyone watching and not knowing Pico 8 is just a very compact way to do games and it's very limited in that it has uh, 128 by 128 pixels. So you have colors um, limited, you have a limited number of sprites and stuff like that, but still people are creative enough to do games and it's a complete uh, workflow, so to say. You have the program language, sprite editor, music, sound, all in one kit. Right. And, and, I, and, the, and the key thing is that it's just an emulator. There isn't yeah. hardware for Pico 8. It's I, just, it's just software. I thought about building actually Pico 8 machine. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. It would be interesting from this NAND to Tetris um, book. So there is kind of a motivation uh, larger than just educating yourself and giving to the community and making people aware of, of the stuff out there. And that's, right. uh, I think, a great uh, thing to have. Um, let's get a bit into the, the video part. How long, how long does it take you to make a video? Oh boy. <clears throat> they say that as you get better at making videos, your video, pro 
your videos get faster and faster. Mine are getting slower and slower because I'm getting better with the tools, but I've also in the last, I don't know, six months, I've become, I've become more aware of editing and pacing. Mm -hmm. And I want to be, I'm trying to be much more conscious of that. And that has been ramping up, like sticking more and more and more. So I try to make one video per week. Even that is hard to keep up with mm -hmm. my other yeah. uh, game development being my, my primary job, but I don't know. I mean, a, a video would probably easily take 20 hours or, or more. Yeah. Um, and as I said, like probably at the very beginning of my video journey, it wouldn't have taken me nearly that much, but also instead of making a video, I would have probably made, you know, five videos with five mm -hmm. different ways. Well, I got this far, we'll continue next time. And now I'm really, I'm trying to be really respectful of the viewer's time. That's something that it was also, it's always been in my mind as a game, de as a game designer. Mm -hmm. When I make a game, I always want to be super respectful of the player's time. Same thing with the videos. I don't want the player doing boring things or feeling that they're wasting their time. Same thing with the video. If, if, in, if there's a, a take that I'm spending five seconds sort of fighting with a chip to get it out, I, they don't need to see that. I'll just yeah. cut that and show you how I remove the, <laughs> the, the chip. So my videos now end up being a lot more concentrated than they used, than they used to back then. And it takes a lot longer to make. So yeah, I, I don't time it. Obviously also it depends on the video. I mean, there are some videos that I set out to make this video. I'm like, okay, well, I'm going to do this repair. And then the repair ends up being this crazy thing that just takes forever. And some other ones like, oh yeah, kind of second thing I tried. Okay, wrap it up, and that was just uh, maybe an eight-hour video, but huh? they do take a while. Okay, so what's your what's your filming editing ratio? Minus one to four, I guess. It depends a lot on the video, actually. It depends a lot on the kind of video. There are some videos that I will have a lot of voiceovers and a lot of graphics that I need to make, and those yeah. take a lot longer in the editing. And there are some videos that are just mostly taking 20 hours of footage and condensing them down yeah. with a few things. So those will take, the ratio will be more on the making than the editing. So mm -hmm. yeah, it depends a lot. Okay. Yeah, I, I, I feel the same. So um, viewer, viewer time is uh, to be respected and I try to cut down and uh, speed up stuff that is just not that interesting. You might want to see how, how someone does it but not in slow motion, so. Right. Yeah. Okay. Which tools do you use? Do we have a, work, a workflow, a tool chain? For making the videos? Yeah. I started recording with almost no equipment. If you go mm -hmm. back, so my initial, my first video was recorded on a phone. I didn't even have lights. No. I barely had a tripod. If you look at it, the shadow of the phone is casting a shadow on my chest <laughs> at the very beginning, so it's horrible. So little by little, I've been upgrading those things. Mm -hmm. So. This camera I really like because it records in 4K, which it's I really like because I release videos in 1080p, not in 4K, which mm. gives me I can zoom in yeah. 100% yeah. or not 100% or like you know twice the size yeah. without losing any resolution, and I really like that. Or sometimes reframe the shots or whatever, yeah. um, and obviously you can do things like you know hold the white balance and set things mm. like that, which is very important. So it's not always changing and, and all that. But beyond that, I do everything in Adobe Premiere Pro for, mm -hmm. for my editing. Um, audio, I'll just record in you know, Audacity or on my phone. Um, and then graphics, again, I will either do them. I do a lot of graphics and animations directly in Premiere, or I'll do things in Photoshop or Illustrator. Mm -hmm. okay. um, but yeah, the, the, there isn't anything fancy about it. <clears throat> the the cycle itself is not as straightforward as you may or as you may think or maybe as I thought at the beginning. It's not I shoot everything and then I edit and then I have something at the end. It's like usually I start with the rough idea of what I'm doing. I'm preparing this. I'm mm -hmm. doing some you know, something else. I do most of it as a, and I'm recording things and sometimes I talk over it and sometimes I don't. As I'm doing this, I'm getting a more concrete idea of what the video really is going to be about yeah. and at that point maybe when i'm done i kind of write a script either with some of the things that 
happen in there or mm -hmm. things that need to be added. I'll start throwing things in the editing in, in, in Premiere. And then that will often have me going back and recording things that mm -hmm. are not in there to like, yeah. oh, I need to pan around and show this thing that now I'm going to be talking about. Or um, then I need to be making all the voiceovers or graphics or so, yeah, it's definitely some back and forth that way. Okay. That's why some people actually with obviously much more successful channels, they hire editors and I, I, I couldn't do it. I mean, the yeah. editing part is totally tied to making the final product. It's, it's totally. not like I have a script that I can give to somebody and the footage is like, go make it. It doesn't work that way. There's a lot that feeds back into more, more content. Yeah, same here. The the story happens in editing, not in, in the in the filming. Right, right. Yeah. And and sometimes radically so. Um, yeah. Sometimes, like actually, this last video that that I'm making is like the, the, there's that Dragon sixty four box mm -hmm. sitting back there. Mm -hmm. It was supposed to be a kind of like a light restoration repair of the dragon, and you know, like fixing the box and cleaning the things. Mm -hmm. And yeah, I, I figured that there was some easy thing with the dragon. It turns out that dragon had a problem in the color signal and it wasn't just tweaking some knobs, which I thought maybe it was initially and even worked fine on my CRT TV, but not on the LCD. And I was even tempted at one point to be like, you know what? It works on the CRT, fine, let's just continue. They're like, no, let me keep looking. And as I kept going deeper and deeper and deeper, actually there was a definite problem and that ended up being the whole video. I said, mm -hmm. no, no, no. The, the story is <laughs> fixing this weird little glitch on the yeah. color generation of the computer. And I had to throw away hours of footage in this case, like, and, and that's fine. It makes it for, it makes it for a much better video. Yeah. So I had three questions, actually. Um, uh, these are like, yes, no questions. So script or no script? Not at the beginning, script at the end. So I, I, I first do whatever and when once I come up with this mm -hmm. with 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 what the outline is in some parts I mean I'll outline it and sometimes I'll even take some bits of uh, video that happens sequentially later and I move them earlier and things like that mm -hmm. to to have a better outline and then even in some points I'll script it especially the voiceovers and that does well as script okay um, plan or improvise combination of both <laughs> as well are you so an 80% like, person or a 101% person? So does it have to be super exact or do you say, oh, okay, come on, fuck it. It's okay. Um, I think personality wise, I tend to be more in the 101, but one of the things that I, that is maddening and, appreci and I appreciate at the same time is that these videos, I just need to make one every week. Or yeah. if I can't do one every week, then it's one every two weeks. But I can't say I'm going to spend six months making a video or I could, but I don't, I don't want to. So that's what happens to me professionally making games. I just take way too long. And yeah. I mean, I think the games need it, but it's refreshing to go through a full release cycle from scratch to actually releasing it in a week. So with the videos it has to be the 80%. It's like, I look at a video, I'm like, I could just make that way better. I could explain that better. I could edit that better, but I can't, I'm, I'm one person and I'm doing one a week. So that's, yeah. that's what it is. Yeah, I see that. Um, do we have some advice for someone who would like to start in this area, retro computing or making videos? <clears throat> um, I guess the advice is kind of like a very generic advice that people use in a lot of different areas, which is do it because you really like it. Don't do it because you're going to get lots of views or subscribers or grow your channel. That may happen and that may not happen. No. Um, I was very lucky, apparently. Um, I, I think the growth in this channel is not typical. I see a lot of people who started about the same time or earlier and haven't had that level of growth in their channel, even though their videos are just as good. So, you know, as long as you enjoy the process of doing it and making it, go for it. That's great. I guess the other advice is don't wait until you have everything perfect. Like I said at the beginning, I started with laughable equipment. I mean, it just, it was so bad 
but it doesn't matter. Like you can still make those videos. You can get the content out. You can learn a lot in the process. And then eventually if you really enjoy it and maybe the channel is more successful and <clears throat> if, if that's a, a, a criteria for you, then you can upgrade some of that equipment, but you don't have to wait until you have the perfect lights and the perfect camera and the perfect setup, everything. You can, mm -hmm. With the technology today, I mean, you really could do it with a, with a, with a smartphone. That's it. You could probably just even edit things directly in the smartphone. So um, everybody can do it. Yeah, I'm actually filming with an iPad. So um, I have an there iPad Pro first generation from 2017, which can do 4K right? and uh, has a good camera and it's all good. I have, don't have to figure out the how the camera works and all the stuff you do we talked about the tools about the videos um do you have a favorite project i don't have a favorite one i have i have a set of favorites usually so this is interesting when i started making these videos i didn't know what the tone was going to be of the channel or anything like this i i started mostly with the repairs that i was doing because that's mm -hmm. what i was doing before and then I've noticed that over time, things have changed a little bit. I mean, I still do repairs, I still do other things, but the ones that I'm enjoying the most are the ones where to solve something, I go deep into why something works the way it works. I think mm -hmm. those are the ones that I enjoy the most. They also seem to get positive feedback from those. So mm -hmm. people seem to enjoy those as well. And I think maybe that's one of the things that it's more unique about the videos that I make because, you know, there are a lot of people repairing a Commodore 64, yeah. but it, it's just very fun for me personally, kind of like this drag and repair, like just figuring out exactly, not just like, oh, I swapped this chip and it worked, but <laughs> why was it doing that? Even it's, 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 sometimes I even do this, like I replace the chip, like, okay, well, that was fixed with that chip, but now I'm putting the faulty chip back in and I want to figure out why that faulty chip what was it doing that it was causing that to happen right um I, those are those tend to be my favorite videos yeah and 80 percent of the cases i would have stopped with the chip swap <laughs> <laughs> in in real life i would but this is an opportunity to say i can actually go deep and and, yeah, sure. and you know use this as an excuse to do that obviously I Professionally, I'll be like, done, move on to the next thing. <laughs> next. Yeah, I totally see the, the appeal. Yeah, one, one of the things that I see coming for me and, well, and the channel is I want to get also more into hardware design, which is yeah. something that I have very little experience. And, and this is a whole other topic. I'm actually thinking of making a very unusual video about this because I told you earlier that my degree is in computer systems engineering. Mm -hmm which is part of electrical engineering. So you would think, oh yeah, I mean, I, 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 sh I should know all the things that I know now to repair the computers, but that was not the case at all. Mm -hmm. um, I found it very frustrating that going to university, the focus was 100% on analysis yeah. of circuits. And actually the class was called circuit analysis. I mean, there was no, there was no surprise there. But for me, that is completely the opposite way of approaching a topic that you're learning about. And I have a bunch of experiences, personal experiences in the past and all that, but, and that's what I want to make a video about. It's kind of like a mini rant about that, but I really wish that it had been flipped, that it had been, even from day one, it's like, hey, we want to make a circuit that outputs 3.2 volts, mm -hmm. but we only have a five volt source. How do we do it? No. And then people go and put a resistor like, okay, great that you thought about that is correct. But now when I connect this, oh, that drops, how do we do this? And, you know, you can learn the same things, motivated them in a very different way. And yeah. I wish they had done that. And in a way, what I feel is like in the last five years, when I started doing these repairs, I started learning things, being motivated by, oh, I want to fix this, or I want to do this, or mm -hmm. why does, you know, so... Yeah, it's been a completely different experience. There's a great book, and it's well, two books actually. Let me grab these. Oh, that's the yes. the, the art of electronics. Yes, I and love that. And there's a companion. Oh, learning the art of electronics, which is a complete course of hardware design by the same guys, oh. Oh. and it's super in depth. And okay. I bought these books uh, not just for uh, their weight. But I'm planning to actually learn 
the stuff in here. I will right. send you one of these, um, oh. of these calls, if you like. Okay, um, yeah. The the art of electronics is I I got that one out yeah like maybe four or five years ago, and it was getting it. I'm like, this is the textbook that I wish I had yeah. back then. I mean, it's dense and heavy and all that, sure. But and you can make a semester out of just four five chapters but it's great it, it really motivates things while still talking about the different laws and the different things that you need to know yeah. about and i've recommended that book to a bunch of people it's it's fantastic yeah. maybe not to start from scratch i think you need to know some basic basic yeah. you know uh, you know concepts but yeah but it's great that is this book and that one is says hands-on lab course so okay. this is i guess you can go in with nothing and knowing what one and zero is and this will get you to designing circuits so that's cool. pretty nice right um right. only browse through it um have it for a few weeks now and then along with that with the hardware design i also i'm planning on learning about um pcb design you know mm -hmm. with probably like kitkat or kicat however you pronounce it and we've started learning some with that already i want to get into you know uh programming cplds and maybe mm -hmm. fpgas i mean there's yeah. just so much stuff to get into and so many interesting projects that uh, yeah the lack of topics is not a problem for videos and learning new things <laughs> that's true that's true yeah i got into 3d printing for some of the projects so i didn't right. design anything before so i got into 3d printing and design stuff it took me hours but still nice to see something in hardware right, created right. from right. your own brain yeah um so any spoilers for upcoming projects you already talked about the dragon 64 32 no uh, that's a 64 one oh, okay but, you know they're 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 close enough spoilers for upcoming projects well so one of the things i guess this is somewhat related to 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 video making so it's interesting one of the things that i realize is that at least for me i'm i'm needing to plan i'm i'm, I'm having to plan further and further out. So I have this spreadsheet with videos yeah. for the year. And right now I have it packed until December 9th. Mm -hmm. And then I have January of next year also packed because January is going to be Jan Strat, you know, like those. Yeah, beer I that. <laughs> <laughs> I <mean>. So, <laughs> so, uh, so yeah, so I have like some, some Amstrad videos for January, but you know, I have a bunch of like, Part of this is because I'm doing Patreon and I release videos there a week early. Yeah. So I'm working with at least two week lead and I like to build a little bit more buffer and, and yeah. all that. So um, I'm looking at that list right now. I guess some of some of the interesting things that I have is I have a little bit more sip tandy stuff. So like, you know, I guess the dragon is kind of tandy. Mm -hmm. um, yes. I have a, 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 a color computer too. Mm -hmm. um, and then some of these videos, I'm actually planning on doing some really, really basic hardware design. So for okay. example, a friend of mine brought me somewhere in the table over back there in that pile of um, junk. He brought me a very weird cartridge for the Spectra Video 328, which is this computer that it was not quite an MSX compatible. It was like mm -hmm. pre-MSX. And it was this little Spanish company that made a cartridge that claims to convert that computer into MSX compatible. And he got hold of a, of one of those cartridges and I don't know what the run was of those things. I mean, they look very handmade, so mm -hmm. probably only a few hundred. And uh, we managed to piece together the ROMs from two different of those devices or something. So the video is gonna be, you know, kind of resurrecting that and trying it out, but then I want to make a replica of that. So it will be a, an opportunity to make a very simple PCB with you know uh, with, with a pretty much with a ROM just for that for for that uh, the SVI three twenty eight and whatnot so that should be a fun beginning of the of the hardware learning. Oh, very cool. Okay. Um, so, do you have any famous last words? <laughs> <laughs> famous last words? No, I don't have any last words. I'm not done talking yet. <laughs> <laughs> continue please, please. <laughs> no no i mean in general I, i'm, I'm going to continue <laughs> with videos and all that but no um anything no not really i think we we cover a lot of things that that i wanted to talk about <clears throat> um about you know 
things that I'm particularly passionate about, like that learning yeah. things um, about the users versus makers and all that. So no, I'm afraid no, no great closing words for me. <laughs> do we have any favorite YouTubers? Oh, or anyone I have, who inspired you to do this? For sure. Um, and I, so, yeah, I mean, I think I started like a lot of people, I started watching the 8-bit guy. I don't even know why it showed up in my feed. It's one of those like things that YouTube recommended. He seems to be like the gateway drug into retro videos. And, you know, I still enjoy his videos. Yeah. Um, Obviously, I really enjoyed Adrian's Digital Basement. is yeah. also one of my favorites. Um, and then, you know, John Beta, um, RMC, you know, so, some of those are just great. And then I really also enjoy watching a lot of the smaller channels. They have some very interesting um, videos. The problem with this is, like, there isn't enough time. I mean, no. it's just... A lot of great content. I wish, I mean, I'm subscribed to all of them, but I do not watch all of them because there's just no time. It's, I cannot make videos and have, and be working on my project and, you know, watch all those videos, unfortunately. So, yeah, sure. It's always this, this balance of uh, consume or create. Yeah. 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 So That's, they also, yeah. I, I think as a creative person, both for videos and for games, it's important that you also consume something because yeah. otherwise you are I, I i really believe that then you're not able to generate as many new creative ideas i mean you yeah, need you're to be self-contained and that is not good yeah. exactly yeah. that might work for a while but not for a long time so i noticed that for me i used to play a lot of video games and i really haven't played many video games at all in the last almost 10 years but I've gotten a lot of my input from board games, for example. That's mm -hmm. the time that I really got into board games and all that. So I, I really feel that if you stop playing games completely, then you would be making more or less the same games and the same ideas, you know, variations on those, which is not necessarily a bad thing, but it certainly prevents you from growing creatively. Mm -hmm. What's your favorite video game of all time? That oh, you actually played? Oh, oh. <laughs> you, you, you can't put me in that spot. Video, <laughs> favorite video game of all time? Top three, okay. <laughs> Give you that. <laughs> you know, I often say it may, may be my favorite, if not one of my favorite. It's actually Fallout 1. Okay. Or Fallout 2. To me, that game felt a true role playing game in a computer. Mm -hmm. When you hear role playing games in computers, they're often action games with stats that increase throughout the game. And sometimes they tell you one story, which is what happens in modern role-playing games because making content is very expensive. Yeah. Very, very, very expensive. Even just a dialogue line, you need to get the, the animation and the, and the voiceovers and all of that and, and, and the data that it takes. And whereas for Fallout, is this isometric game. It's all text-based. They made it so there isn't one story and there isn't one path. It's really... You are there. There is this world that will interact with you in different ways. And it's the story that you uncover. Mm -hmm. And I remember being blown away by like one particular example, which is it's just such a lost opportunity in, in most games, especially modern games. You walk into a village, into some kind of settlement, and there's two factions at war. And if you happen to walk in one way and you talk to some people first, you realize like, oh, the other people are attacking them and they're being oppressed and they're trying to drive them away from that town. So they ask your help to, to go destroy the other people. And you're like, well, yeah, the other people are bad and these ones are good. Yeah, I'll do that. And maybe you do it and you totally blow the other people away and they take over the town, great. But then if you replay it and you happen to enter that settlement on the other direction, you talk to those people and you realize that their story is very similar. It's like, oh, we lived here before the other people took over the town and now we're trying to take back the town that was ours. And, you know, they killed and enslaved our, you know, half our people. And, and you're like, oh, wow. And, and that is how most real world conflict is. It's not like one person that is trying to be evil and one person that's trying to be good. They both think they're doing the right thing. And I felt that Fallout nailed that in a way that no other game, no other RPG really ever did. Okay, so. I never played that. 
Interesting. It, it's totally worth it. Uh, I'd say do it and and don't play it like you need to change your mindset. Like, don't try to maximize your stats and get the best weapon. And it, you, I've read stories of people playing Fallout, the original Fallout, not not three, four, whatever. Mm -hmm. The original Fallout, you can play them without ever touching a weapon. You can play the okay. whole game talking to people or sneaking by or being a pacifist or doing hand-to-hand -hand combat only. So, I mean, you can really play that game thinking, what is my character? And I'm going to play this character. Mm -hmm. And it's playable. You may die and then you reload, but it's definitely playable. So you can be, I'm going to be a coward that is going to steal. Boom. You can play that thing. I mean, so mm -hmm. that's, that's why it's a true role-playing game that way. Okay, yeah, it reminds me a little of the um, old SSI AD and D um, games like Eye of the Beholder and stuff like that. But they, of course, had one straight story. Right, that, that was a story, and you were there to kill things to down yeah. go down deeper in the level. I, mean, I love those games. I remember making the maps for all the levels. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, but yeah, that and, and very similar to Fallout. You would think like, oh, there's like Baldur's Gate, for example. Yeah. But Baldur's Gate was a traditional role-playing game mm. and uh, in the computer, whereas Fallout really was very unique that way. Cool. Do we have a favorite 8-bit game? A favorite 8-bit game? <sighs> yes, but that's going to be mostly out of nostalgia more than this is a, an amazing game by today's standards. Just mm -hmm. the game that I played a lot and I enjoyed a lot. I think I would have to pick Gun Fright, which is the bit made by Ultimate. Is like okay. the people made Night Lore and Alienate yeah. and all those. Not a lot of people like Gunfright in particular. I think by then they were kind of getting sick of the whole isometric thing. But mm -hmm. just for me, it just hit me in the, the right time, the, the, the right moment. And I thought it was an amazing game. Actually, one of the really funny things is like, of course, they were all being cracked, the, the games at the time, actually. I, back in the day, this is a separate thing. I almost, no, I almost know. I definitely spent more time cracking games than playing games. Mm -hmm. you know, like people would bring the games to me. I would like break the, crack the copy protection, cop, you yep. know, copy them over to disk and then, <laughs> you know, send them back. Um, and that's how I learned a lot of low level programming and assembly and all that. But um, <clears throat> so that game, I had no idea what you were supposed to do. And you're this, you know, person in a Western town and there's like people around and, so it was just fun piecing it together, what you were supposed to do. And then mm -hmm. it actually took me forever to realize that this little people, like children, they're like bouncing and pointing with their finger. They're pointing the direction of the guy that you're supposed to be looking for, the, oh, the, okay. because you're a bounty hunter. <laughs> and before that, I was just randomly going through the town, but it has some really cool things like- Putting kids, yeah. <laughs> yeah. It, it was just really cool that it had a very strong sense of place because the map was always the same. So you actually- eventually learned the town inside and out and you could navigate it you know blindfolded pretty much and you're like oh if the kid is pointing this way then i need to be going that way and it's something that was lost later because later like games are like oh well we should be making new towns and new levels and layouts all the time and there's something really interesting about always having the same level it's almost like when i played quake the original quake back in the day i actually really enjoyed just playing the first four or five levels and knowing them really 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 <laughs> deeply to the point that you know we play a lot of multiplayer quake and i would hear at like an elevator and know exactly where the person was and how to get there and i would be running by throw a grenade without even looking and boom you know you kill the person in the elevator because you heard them somewhere i love that kind of you know deep knowledge which i guess is kind of like a common thing with my the videos pattern? so <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. Okay, cool. Um, it was totally amazing talking to you and getting to know you much better, I guess. I hope that we have some, um, or that we had some interesting topics for the, yeah. for the viewer or the listener. Um, and well, you're, you're a great guy. And I see a lot of parallels in our upcoming and our uh, origin story. And um, as I said in the intro, I love your channel. I love these in-depth uh, digging around and showing people how it's done. 
And I wish that you uh, become one of the greats in the uh, YouTube retro channel <laughs> universe. So <laughs> thank you. Um, yeah, and I really enjoy watching your videos and learning stuff. And I, I also use your uh, C64 diagnostic routines and stuff like that. Um, <laughs> so um, I learned a lot from you. So cool. thanks for that. Yeah, you're welcome. And, um, yeah, thanks for your time. I appreciate your time. We um, committed to an hour. So this is pretty much the hour. <laughs> Could talk to you for forever, really. Um, and maybe we do part two. Let's see. Sounds good. Some other time. Thanks for having me over. Thank you. This is Retro is your new black. If you are new to the channel, please like and subscribe. Thanks for watching and until next time.